And so uh, welcome everyone to the Spectral Geometry in the Cloud Seminar. Today we have the pleasure of uh, having Ilaria Lucardesi from Université de Lorraine. And she will speak about the maximization of the first non-trivial Neumann eigenvalue of the Laplacian on the perimeter constraint. The virtual stage is yours. You can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alexander. And thanks uh, to the organizers for this invitation. It is a pleasure to give a talk today. So I'm going to present you some uh, so a recent result in collaboration with uh, Antoine Aro and Antoine Lemenan, who are both uh, in Nancy. And uh, so a short uh, history, a couple of years ago, we decided to work together on, on some topic and Antoine Aro came with a, with a very nice open problem that is written here in red. Uh, so this is a shape optimization problem. It is a maximization of, uh, of mu one. I'm going to, to give the mathematical details in a minute under perimeter constraint. And he heard about this open problem during an open problem session in Oberwald like more than 10 years ago uh, and by, by Rick Laugesen. And the same open problem can be found in this uh, book by Laugesen and Sudeja. And the nice fact is that this open problem comes together with a conjecture. And this is what uh, surprised us because the conjecture says that in the plane, this problem that I'm going to define has exactly two optimizers. So there exist two maximizers, which, which are exactly, precisely, the equilateral triangle with uh, the prescribed the perimeter that we have fixed and the square. So this, uh, uh, this, this property, this conjecture attracted our attention and we decided to uh, try to prove this, uh, this conjecture in the plane. So let me now go more uh, into the detail and just fix some to, to start, pick some notations. So, what is mu one for me? So, mu one is uh, one again value of uh, the uh, Neumann Laplacian. In other words, uh, uh, let us consider a shape omega, so a subset over n, and uh, the PD problem, uh, the eigenvalue problem minus Laplacian of u equal to mu u, complemented by homogeneous Neumann boundary condition. It is well known that uh, the family of eigenvalues uh, mu is uh, countable. And, uh, and this uh, family of uh, uh, non-negative uh, uh, real numbers. Therefore, they can be ordered in an increasing way. And I will denote, it that I will denote them by uh, the very first one. So the smallest one is zero. Because uh, uh, of course, this problem here is solved for, for, by, um, for example, by constants. So if you take u to be constant, uh, mu, equal to zero solves the problem. So the, the smallest one is zero, and it is not very interesting to, to be studied. The first non-trivial eigenvalue of this problem, which is interesting, is uh, uh, the, the first positive one, which is denoted here by mu one. So mu one for me will be the first non-trivial one. The PD definition, um, is uh, just to introduce it, but but we will uh, more um, we will make use of uh, this variational characterization. So mu one can be also defined in an equivalent way as uh, the minimum of the Rayleigh quotient of the ratio of uh, the integral of gradient of u square divided by the integral of u square computed among the h one functions which have zero average. The condition of zero average is nothing but an orthogonality condition of the test functions to the uh, constant, so to the eigenspace of mu zero. This variational characterization is for us more useful because we will study a maximization problem for mu one. So we will uh, look for upper bounds of mu one. And actually, if the shape of omega is given, and uh, if we are able to find a test function, so a function which has zero average on the shape, a direct computation of the relay quotient immediately gives us an upper bound. So I will make use of this characterization many times. About the shape optimization of mu1, well, mu1 as uh, the other eigenvalues is in general very hard to be computed explicitly. Therefore, uh, one usually looks for estimates which depend on geometric quantities. As I said, I will be interested in maximization of mu1. And let me mention that uh, a constraint that has been associated to mu1 in the maximization is uh, the volume constraint. So what is uh, um, 
can we maximize mu1 under volume constraint? Well, equivalently, one can maximize the product of the volume to the power 2 over n, where n is the dimension, times mu1. And the, um, the maximizer is, uh, in any dimension, the ball. And this has been proved by Zico in dimension 2 and then extended to any dimension by Weinberger. And I will refer to this inequality in the sequel by Zico Weinberger in the form. And I will use this many times. I also mentioned that uh, uh, I will not use it, but uh, there is uh, another uh, geometric constraint that has been considered, which is the diameter. And uh, what we consider uh, in our problem is actually the perimeter constraint. So can, what can we say about maximization of mu1 time, uh, with the perimeter constraint? Well, as before, the perimeter can be enclosed into the shape functional by multiplying it by a suitable power. So the right uh, power uh, of the perimeter is perimeter to the power 2 over n minus 1 times mu1. And this product here, as it happened for this product here, is scale invariant. Well, the maximization problem under any extra assumption is uh, trivial in the sense that uh, the supremum is plus infinity. And here there is a, an, a very bad drawing of a maximizing sequence. So it is enough to, to build a perturbation of, uh, of a nice set. So a perturbation of a square, for example, by taking a, an oscillating boundary with, which uh, oscillated a lot. And this makes uh, in the limit, uh, the perimeter uh, say explode and uh, mu1 uh, uh, stays bounded. So the interesting problem in uh, maximization of mu1 under perimeter constraint is when one adds some extra assumption, for example, on convexity. Well, adding a convexity constraint, we have that the, max the maximum exists. Because with convexity, together with the fact that this functional here is scale invariant, we have compactness. Of, of the class of shapes, because we can assume without loss of generality that all the convex shapes are enclosed into a fixed box. And so we have uh, uh, that a, a maximizing sequence converges with respect to the host of convergence to something. And we just need to check that this limit here is not uh, collapsing to, to a segment. And this is ruled out by a direct competition. So this is an interesting problem. The maximum exists. And now the problem is what is this maximum and what, what are the maximizers? And here comes the conjecture. Let me state uh, once again, and more precisely, the conjecture in the plane. So in the plane, capital N is equal to two. Therefore, the problem, the maximization is uh, of the perimeter to the power two times mu one. So the conjecture uh, is the following in the plane. Every convex set satisfies perimeter to the power 2 times mu1 less than or equal to 16 pi square. And the equality is attained at the square and at the equilateral triangle. Let me just uh, uh, say a couple of comments. For the square and for the triangle, everything is explicit. So these are two shapes for which mu1 can be computed exactly. In general, it is not the case, but here, everything is explicit, and the product is exactly 16 pi squared. Another check that can be done is that this inequality here, the conjecture inequality, is uh, coherent with uh, the exact Zigo Weinberger inequality. So let me consider the area times mu1. We can multiply and divide by perimeter to the power 2, and uh, pair area and perimeter square and perimeter square times mu1. First of all, we can bound from above area divided by perimeter square by this perimetric inequality, and we find one over four pi. And then if the conjecture is true, we have that perimeter square times mu1 is below 16 pi square. So in the end, we find as upper bound four pi. And this is the, um, let's say, this is true if the conjecture is true. On the other hand, we know that uh, the product area times mu1 is bounded above by an optimal constant, which is the value of this product at the disk, which is pi times j11 prime squared, where j11 prime is the derivative 
uh, sorry, is the first zero of the, the derivative of the first Bessel function. And this value here is uh, uh, more or less 3.39 pi, which is less than four pi. So this is a, a good, um, uh, let's say it is a remark that says that maybe the conjecture is true. So uh, what, we, uh, what we prove actually is a uh, result which goes in the direction of the conjecture, but does not prove the conjecture in uh, full generality. Because we need to add an extra assumption to the class of shapes, and we need to, so to, to restrict ourselves to a smaller class. Uh, well, the smaller class, so the property that we add is a property that the triangle and the square share, and actually it is symmetry. So what we prove, actually this is the result is of last year, but now we are uh, adjusting the, the last details of proofs. Well, the inequality, the claimed inequality, the conjecture by Lagos and Sudeja is true in the plane for convex sets which have two axes of symmetry. So we assume that there are two axes of symmetry. The idea of the proof, so what I'm going to present you in, uh, in this next half an hour is uh, based on, uh, on the fact that, uh, so we, we heavily exploit the, uh, the presence of these two axes of symmetry. And the proof follows different strategies. And uh, every strategy is designed exploiting the position of these two mutual, uh, the mutual position of these two axes. More precisely, let me denote by theta the smallest angle between two axes. Because actually, if you have two axes of symmetry, you can play with these two to find that there are more than two axes of symmetry. And if theta is the smallest of, uh, of the angles between two axes, either theta is equal to zero, and in this case, we are in the case of the disk because we have infinitely many axes of symmetry and the shape is circular, or theta turns out to be uh, pi over k. And here we uh, divide the proof into three cases. The case in which the angle is quite small, so it is of the form pi over k with k quite big. And then we have the two cases uh, of the two axes of symmetry, orthogonal axis of symmetry as it happens for the square. And then we have actually three axes of symmetry, the same axis of symmetry of the equilateral triangle. So the case of the disk is the easy one. And uh, it is ruled out by direct computation because our function are computed at the disk gives uh, something which is strictly less than 16 pi squared. Let me now um, give more details about these three other cases. So what happens if uh, theta is small? So if uh, theta is small, our shape is not very far from being circular. So the idea is to use a quite rough estimate because uh, our set is, uh, well, it's very far from being uh, the triangle or the square. So intuitively, it will be far from the optimal set and there is enough room to have the right estimate even with uh, quite rough bounds. The idea is to use uh, the Zygovan-Berger inequality. So to uh, make the area functional come uh, uh, into play. So we, we have our functional perimeter to the power two times mu one, we multiply and divide by the area. Then we uh, pair the perimeter to the power two with the area and the area times mu one. The area times mu one is bounded above by the zero Weinberger. And so we have, uh, we have uh, let's say, uh, erased our mu one from uh, the bound. So it has disappeared. And we are led to um, maximize the ratio perimeter to the power two uh, and area among the sets which have these two axes of symmetry. So um, we have get rid of mu one and we just have this geometric uh, shape functional to, to be studied. Let me denote by C theta, the family of these convex shapes which have uh, two axes of symmetry of angle theta. Of course, uh, in view of uh, this uh, symmetry property, the behavior of uh, an admissible shape omega tilde is uh, characterized by what happens in the sector of angle theta. 
So let me denote by uh, small omega the portion of, uh, of an omega tilde which falls into the sector, and by small gamma the part of boundary which falls into the sector. So of course, uh, the global perimeter is 2k, 2K times the length of the small gamma. And the area, the total area, is 2k times the area of small omega. So let me rewrite the maximization problem that we have in this right-hand side. It is nothing but 2k times the maximum over uh, of this length to the power 2 divided by the area over the subsets omega of this set which are convex, but not only. They need to have the property that when we reflect over these two axes, reflection keeps the convexity. So let me describe more precisely what are the, uh, the shapes omega, small omega, that uh, can fall into this uh, sector. Let me denote by capital A and capital B the intersections between the shape of omega, the boundary of small omega, and the two axes of symmetry. Since the, the, our shape functional is scale invariant, we are free to fix something. So we are free to choose only one thing. And let me fix this length here to be one. So the length of OA, let it be one. In other words, A is fixed. What about B? Well, B is not free to be anywhere in this axis because of convexity. Actually, B is constrained to, to lie between two points, B1 and B2, which are given by the intersection of the uh, orthogonal lines to the two axes passing through A. Why? Because, well, if B is, uh, is below B1, uh, by contradiction, it means that the boundary of small omega, so this blue boundary, arrives like that. So it, if it arrives at a point B below B1, it arrives like that. And so when we reflect on the axis OB1, well, convexity is violated. And similarly, if B, by contradiction, if B is above B2, well, it means that the blue boundary arrives at A like that above this, uh, this orthogonal line. And when we reflect shape over the, uh, the axis, this vertical axis, convexity is once again violated. So it means that when A is fixed here, B is constrained between these uh, two, two points. Well, now let B be fixed. So for a given B, we can be even more precise in the description of our, our shape. Actually, um, the, the shape, this light blue shape, of course, it contains by convexity the triangle OAB. And at the same time, it is contained into a quadrilateral, OAHB, where H is the intersection of the orthogonal segment AB2 passing through A, orthogonal to the axis vertical, and the segment, which is, so the, the axis, well, the segment uh, BH, which is orthogonal to this axis, passing through B, for the same reason illustrated before. So actually, we have two sets, one enclosed into our small omega and the other enclosing it. And this gives us immediately an upper bound for the length of this boundary, for this blue boundary, and a lower bound for the area of a small omega. So why I've done all that? Because uh, we wanted to maximize the length of a gamma to the power two divided by the area. This is bounded above by, well, instead of the length of gamma, we put the length of AH plus the length of HB to the power two. And instead of the area of this light blue region, we put the area of the triangle OAB. And these, all these quantities here only depend on B because H is uniquely determined once B is fixed. In other words, this right-hand side here is a, a, a function of one variable. And so it is uh, much easier to be, uh, to be studied and uh, it can be um, maximized. And it turns out that uh, the, uh, the maximizer, so the maximal 
the maximal B between B1 and B2 turns out to be B2. And the direct computation shows that this maximum here is twice the tangent of phi over k. So all in all, we have uh, given an upper bound for this maximization problem. Now, going back to our starting, uh, uh, starting point, we have that perimeter to the power two times new one is bounded above by, we had uh, twice k time pi j11 square times d. And now we can optimize with respect to k. And actually, the, the worst k, let's say, the, the k which gives us uh, the largest upper bound is uh, k equal to 5. And computing this object here, we find something which is strictly less than 16 pi squared. So this concludes the proof for um, two axes of symmetry, which are um, close each other. And uh, as I said, it is uh, based on uh, geometric uh, arguments. And uh, here, mu1 has uh, disappeared. So um, let me now pass to uh, the proof uh, sorry, of uh, the case of two orthogonal axes of uh, symmetry. Here, I've uh, written again the, um, our statement, so what we want to prove. And well, here, the proof is, uh, is different in the sense that we will need to, to exploit the variational characterization of a new one. The main idea uh, is to, to split the functional perimeter square times new one with, uh, into two parts. So really to, to bound from above separately the perimeter and new one using introducing another uh, shape functional, which is the minimal width. I recall what is the minimal width. It is uh, the minimal distance of two parallel lines enclosing a set. Or if you prefer, it is the, the width of uh, the smallest width of a stripe enclosing the set. The first bound uh, that we prove is this uh, uh, very nice new inequality. So we bound from above new one by this uh, shape functional involving uh, the minimal width. So we have minimal width to the power two divided by the square of the area times by square. And actually uh, we, we will use it for convex shapes, but it, uh, it holds true also without convexity assumption and symmetry assumption. Well, once we have that, it is clear that we have this corollary. So if you are able to prove that for a given shape, the perimeter is bounded above by the suitable quantity, which matches this one, giving 16 pi square. So in other words, if the perimeter is smaller than four area divided by the width, we have that the perimeter square is bounded above by 16 area to the power two, width to the power, divided by width to the power two, and combining these two, we exactly find 16 pi square. So if for a convex set this is true, then we are done. This inequality is satisfied. So this is trivial. But what is more interesting is that this inequality here is satisfied in the cases of two orthogonal axes of symmetry. In other words, we have proved the conjecture, the conjecture for two orthogonal axes of symmetry. So I need to prove now this first, uh, this theorem too, and also this, that the fact that this inequality is satisfied for um, double symmetric uh, shapes. Okay, what about uh, uh, this, uh, this statement? So some definition, let me uh, take a bounded open set with Lipschitz boundary omega and let me denote by W the minimal width and by capital A, the area. So up to a rigid motion, we put our set into an horizontal stripe centered at the horizontal axis. What we do now is that we take a rectangle R which is centered at the origin, this, uh, uh, this green rectangle here. And uh, it has uh, eighth equal to W, and we take its, uh, mm, the length of uh, its side, capital L, so that its area is exactly equal to the area of the shape omega. Then we define a function U that I've, uh, uh, mm, here is a picture of this function, we define u to be 
In the rectangle, it is one eigenfunction of, uh, of the rectangle with respect to the Neumann, the first Neumann eigenvalue. And we extend it constantly on, uh, on the rest of the stripe. So it is a sinus in the rectangle, depending only on one variable, extended to one on the right and to minus one on the left. So this is uh, defined on the whole stripe. And uh, as I said, it is an extension of an eigenfunction in the sense that if we compute the Rayleigh quotient of u in the rectangle, we find the mu1 of r, which is equal to pi squared over this length to the power. Well, we would like to use this u as this function for the Rayleigh quotient for omega. But unfortunately, in general, the average of u is not zero on omega. But it is not a big problem in the sense that we can translate omega. So we can just make a translation into the stripe so that the average of u is, uh, is equal to zero. And of course, well, here I've formalized what I just said. If we take a translation omega x naught of, of x naught of our shape, mu one does not change, but mu u becomes admissible. So let us now compute the Rayleigh quotient of u on this translated set. Well, for the numerator, so the integral of gradient of u to the power two, of course, since u is extended to be constant outside the rectangle, this uh, integral here is uh, equal to the integral over the intersection of our shape and the rectangle of the gradient of u to the power two. And this is, of course, bounded above by the integral over the, the rectangle, the full rectangle of the gradient of u squared. As for the denominator, we need to give a lower bound to have globally an upper bound. So the integral over the set omega x naught of u squared can be split as follows. So on the part, on the common part uh, of omega with the rectangle, we keep u squared. And on the part which is uh, in omega, but not in the rectangle, we have that u is equal to one. So the contribution of the integral is nothing but the area of this set difference. And now we bound from below the integral of u over omega intersection r. We bound it from below as the integral over the whole rectangle, and we have to subtract the contribution on this uh, green part here. And uh, since we have a minus sign, and since u is less than or equal to one, at, uh, the, so the worst case is that we have integral over r of u squared minus the area of this set difference here, r minus, gamma, minus omega. And so we have this expression in the right hand side. And here a miracle happens because we have started from a rectangle R, which has the same area of omega. Therefore, these two contributions cancel out. And so in the end, we have that the integral over omega of u square is greater than or equal to the integral over R of u square. So all in all, we have that mu one over our uh, shape omega, by definition, is less than or equal to the real quotient of u. And here we have seen that this is bounded above by the real quotient of u in the rectangle, which is exactly equal to mu1 over the rectangle, which is pi square over L square. Now, exploiting the fact that capital L was chosen so that the area of the rectangle and omega are the same, we immediately find this. Find this uh, this ratio here, which is nothing but our statement. So uh, let's say in this proof, the key point was to use uh, as test function an eigenfunction of, uh, of a rectangle to, to deduce uh, the property for mu one. So uh, let us now pass to the other uh, inequality that has to be proved for the perimeter. So it, it is part of a Crowley one. We want to prove that uh, for a convex set, which has two orthogonal axes of symmetry, we have that the perimeter is bounded above by 
this quantity involving the minimal weight. Well, here the proof is uh, quite simple and uh, is made on polygons because it is enough to prove uh, this fact for polygons and then by density, it will be valid for any convex set. Once again, it is enough to study what happens in this uh, portion of plane between two axes of symmetry. So let us assume that we have a polygon which has sides of length AI. And let me denote by HI the eighth of uh, these triangles made by one side AI and uh, so connecting this side with, uh, with the origin with two segments. Of course, the global perimeter of omega will be four times the perimeter of this blue region. So four times the sum of the length IA. As for the area, it is four times the sum of the areas of these triangles, and each of them is AI times HI divided by two. All in all, we have that area is twice the sum of products AI times HI. Well, now we, we need to, uh, to, to find somewhere this minimal width. Well, the minimal width comes out with a, a very simple remark. So let me take A1, for example. We have this side here, A1. Then we perform the first symmetry with respect to horizontal axis, and we find this side A1 hat. Then we perform the second symmetry with respect to the vertical axis, and we find this A1 double hat. Well, we have that in the end, the set A1 double hat is parallel to the segment A1. And the shape omega is enclosed between these two lines, two green lines. Now, the distance between the two lines is nothing but twice the eighth A1. And it means that twice eighth uh, H, HI or H1 is greater than or equal to the minimal width by definition of minimal width. Therefore, in the computation of the area, we can replace every two times hi, putting an inequality sign, we can replace it by minimal width. And so we conclude that the area is bounded below by minimal width times the sum of ai, and the sum of ai is nothing but perimeter divided by four. So in the end, we, we have found the, uh, the desired inequality. So the perimeter is bounded above by four area divided by this minimal width. Well, this proof here works only for uh, convex shapes with two axes of symmetry. So it does not work in general without these uh, two assumptions. So let me uh, now conclude with the, the very last part of, uh, of the presentation. So what happens if uh, the two axes of symmetry have uh, an angle of pi over three. So what happens if our shape has actually three axes of symmetry, which are the axes of symmetry of the equilateral triangle? So here the idea is to combine somehow the two approaches presented before. So in some cases, in some steps, we will use the Ziegel-Weinberger inequality, namely we will make the area functional appear. Or in other cases, we will use the variational characterization of new one. So we will employ suitable test functions for um, new one of omega. And they will be, for example, if one of the axes is the vertical one, we will take uh, an, an odd again function of the equilateral triangle. It will be always a good test function since it is odd of, uh, of our shape uh, omega. Well, in both cases, uh, it is important to find some, uh, a pairs of sets. The former, which, is, uh, which contains our shape omega, and the latter, which is contained into it. So it is important to uh, approach our set from outside and inside with the smart pairs of sets. Why? Because, well, for the perimeter, we can have an upper bound of the perimeter by taking the, uh, the outer set. As for mu1, well, once we have a suitable test function, mu1 is the ratio, we can bound from above the numerator by integrating over the bigger set. 
and we find a lower bound for the numerator for the denominator by taking an integral over the smaller set. So it is important to have test functions, uh, smaller set and bigger set. So these are the, the key ingredients. So um, what we do as a first attempt is the following. So we have these uh, three axes of symmetry. We, uh, we start by constructing an horizontal line, which is, found, which is tangent from below to the set. Tangent, it means that there is a point here in this axis, which is a con uh, contact point. Then we play with the, this axis of symmetry, and actually we find that the, reflect, the reflection, the, the symmetrization of this horizontal line with respect to the other two axes of symmetry are tangent lines too. So in particular, we find that there are at least three points, three tangent points in this green equilateral triangle. So we have found with this procedure a set, an equilateral triangle capital T, which contains our shape. And connecting the three tangent points, actually, we find that there is another equilateral triangle, which is flipped with respect to the first one, and which is contained. So we have, as I said before, we have a bigger set, a smaller set, and we have an idea of a test function, which could be an eigenfunction, for example, of mu one of the triangle. Well, actually, this choice here doesn't work. It is not enough precise. So we can, we can have an upper bound of mu one of omega times perimeter square, but it is not enough good. So it doesn't work in general. So we need to be more precise in, the, in, this, uh, in this procedure of constructing shapes. And so we are, uh, one idea is to, to introduce a parameter, a first parameter small a. So what we do is that we start from our big triangle, let's say that it has a side one, then we have the small triangle. Well, what we do is that we take now an horizontal line, which is tangent from above. Well, this cuts an equilateral triangle of, su of some side, let's say that it is small a, this length here. Uh, by, by, again, by, by symmetry, we will have that uh, if this is, okay, this will be uh, on the axis, another contact point, and these other points here will be contact points, and these triangles here will not be in our set. So all in all, we have that our shape, uh, which is light blue here, contains this hexagon red here, and this contained into this green hexagon. So this is more precise. Uh, it is a more precise description of, uh, of the shape. And the idea is to study our, so to give uh, upper bounds of our functional according to the value of A. So we will divide the proof into three cases. What happens if A is small? So if the set is um, quite close to the big triangle, then we have intermediate cases, and then we have large values of A, which correspond to shapes which are close to this small equilateral triangle. And now I will uh, just sketch with pictures what, uh, what will be the idea of proof in these three cases. Well, uh, just a remark in the following, I will uh, make some pictures. And actually, I will describe what happens to the set in this uh, region here. So our, our shape, as you see, it is uh, made of six copies. So one, two, three, four, five, six, six copies of what happens here, for example. So we are between, in this region here, we are between the, this triangle, which has this red side, and this trapezoid, which has this green side. For A small, this is the hardest part, we actually need to be more and more precise in the description of the set. We need to introduce two other parameters. So I said we are in that region between a triangle and a trapezoid. So we uh, introduce a first parameter T uh, as follows. We take a tangent line to the set parallel to AC. And we denote by T the length of this, uh, of this segment here. 
And uh, okay, so this gives this first tangent line gives us a bigger set. So this gives us the fact that A and that our light blue shape is contained into the polygon, this point A, B of T, C of T, C. And as for the contained set, we need to introduce another parameter S, which describes the position of uh, the tangent point in this tangent line, which runs between B of T and C of T. And this gives us uh, an, inner, an inner set. As for the test function, a good idea was to consider, an, as I said before, an eigenfunction which is uh, odd, so which is um, yeah, odd with, with respect to, to the vertical axis, but actually it doesn't work. So we are forced to consider a convex combination of uh, an odd eigenfunction of the big triangle and an odd eigenfunction of the small triangle. Well, just to say that it is very hard, very technical, and uh, we have uh, almost finished. And uh, the numerical computations show that uh, this idea uh, works in this case. Okay, sorry. So I was saying that this intermediate case is easier and we, uh, we reduce to the Zygo-Weinberger uh, well, So we, we use Zygo-Weinberger to reduce ourselves to optimize the ratio perimeter to the power two divided by the area among the shapes which are between these, uh, the triangle and the trapezoid. So, so th this is quite easy to be done because it is purely geometrical and the mu one has disappeared. And the very last case, so between one third and one half, actually we uh, can um, recover this result by using the previous ones. Actually, I've said we just turned the head in the sense that the procedure that I have shown consists in taking a tangent triangle of side one and defining a parameter small a. And then to, to define small a, actually we have found, so a is determined by another tangent triangle, which is flipped with respect to the first one. So it has a horizontal, uh, so the horizontal side is, uh, is in the upper, upper part. Well, this construction could have been done starting from this red triangle. So we could have, instead of starting from the tangent from below, we could have started from the tangent line from above. And then we could have said, we could have defined the parameter B as uh, the, the part cut by this, uh, this line here. So actually starting from this, uh, this red triangle, uh, we, we find another parameter b, and it turns out that when a is big, b is small in some sense. And when a is between one third and one half, b, if we properly rescale the, uh, the red triangle, is between zero and one third. So this uh, allows to, to recover, to, to answer to this point without making all the computations again. So let me just uh, conclude with uh, a... Um, uh, with, with a summary of what we have done. So we have proved this uh, conjecture inequality in the case of two axes of symmetry. And uh, what is still open are these questions. So is it true that uh, the optimal domain without any, without, without this assumption of double symmetry, but among convex sets, is it true that the domain is symmetric? Or is it true that if we have one axis of symmetry, this entails two axes of symmetry? Is it true that optimality entails symmetry or is it true that optimality entails that the optimal set is polygonal? So these are still open problems and uh, I hope that we will be able to uh, find an answer uh, in the future. And with that, I stop and I thank you for, for your attention. Well, thank you very much. We can thank the speaker. And uh, we have time for questions. So I have a question, it's uh, Alexandre. When you said in the, the slide before that you apply a Sega and Vega for the domain between two, uh, two yes. hexagons, I think I'm just a bit confused. How do you go from the bound for the domain between the two hexagons to the bound for the domain that you're studying? Or is that the domain itself? So, uh, he, I'm not sure to understand the question, but uh, I said that we use Siegel van Berg in the sense that in the product perimeter to the power two times mu one, we multiply and divide by the area. Bound from above area mu one, 
with uh, Ziegler and Barrett, and then we are led to the maximization of perimeter to the power two divided by the area between these two two shapes here. So between the triangle and the trapezium. Thank you. Okay, actually, I have another question. Is it clear that is it uh, obvious, or is I mean, I'm sure it's true, but how do you see that you can uh, approximate uh, with polygon and that's continuous for the this problem when you have uh, domains that are not polygonal? So you you think well the, the only point in which you we use that this is here in which we use convexity actually in which we use uh, sorry um, the fact that we have polygons that are dense in convex sets is this your question yes you're saying that the, for the Neumann problem this is uh, when you take a sequence of polygons that approximate a smooth domain it will be continuous in the limit well I I use continuity and density only in this point. But if you have a convergence with respect to the, if you have ouster convergence, is, uh, everything is, uh, is continuous. Okay, okay, thank you. In the class of convex domains, uh, Alexandre. Yeah, yeah, in the class of convex Yes, okay, okay. And uh, I think like phenomena like the Babushka paradox are only for uh, higher order operators, right? Things like this. I think uh, Antoine replied, I think, I'm not sure. Yes, I, I replied. I no, no, the, with, the, equations. with the convexity, you do not uh, have any problem. And okay. uh, of course, you you might have non-continuity of Neumann eigenvalue when you have uh, rooms and passages and so, something yes. like that. Yes. With convexity, no, nothing can occur. Thank you. Okay, so okay. I have one co uh, question. Uh, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. So uh, in the case of 3D, uh, so perimeter becomes surface area. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in that case, you know, there's any similar conjecture at this point, or I'm, I'm just curious. We, we didn't uh, study that. I guess that something can be uh, done also in 3D. I think that we have thought about the construction of this, uh, this result here. I think that this could be true in dimension three, just adding a dimension here. But uh, in general, we, we did not think about uh, the 3D case, and I think it is very much harder. But uh, no, I don't yeah, know, we didn't yeah. think about it. I think that something can be rephrased easily, but in general, no. Yeah, but As, some, again, I think a symmetry will become very important in the case of 3D. But of course, uh, exploring a, three, a symmetry in 3D is much more difficult. Yeah, I, I agree. But mm -hmm. I was just curious whether there's any corresponding uh, conjecture in 3D. No, I don't know about conjectures. OK, it was just, thank you, thank no. you. Yep. Uh, Jonathan, you had a question? Yes, uh, so thank you for the very nice talk. Um, the first question is very vague. Uh, how, how far do you feel are you away from the, like the general case without symmetries? Uh, I in think quite far. <laughs> well, quite far in the sense that we, we have tried a little bit, but um, we didn't manage and um, also the proof uh, with two axes of symmetry is very hard uh, it's very technical let's say very, very technical so i don't think that it is um it, it will be easy so i, I think it's uh, we, we are far from, from it yeah i see but I've, i mean i found the, the the proof for like two orthogonal axes of symmetry looks like surprisingly simple actually yeah, yes. When, if one has the, the right idea, of course. Um, is, there, uh, is there a preprint already available? I've not found it on archive. No, no, no not yet. We are in the, I mean, the, this part is uh, annoying, <laughs> this part here. So it is not yet. Uh, we, we need to, to conclude this, uh, this thing here. Mm -hmm. So to, to write it down, just yeah, to write yeah, it I down. See. So. OK, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and there's also a few questions in the chat. So Chris George is asking if we restrict attention to domains with axes of symmetry of angle uh, pi over k and k greater than five, is the maximizer a regular k gone? Uh, so in the case, I, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, is there an expecting okay. maximizer, I guess? Let me let me think. Uh, well, let me go back to the to the picture that you've done because um, when we are here, uh, actually here we say that uh, it is uh, in B two. So what does it mean? So the, the easy answer is that uh, 
the maximizer should be. I, I would say it's not it's not clear because uh, mm. as you see the, the disk is not a good candidate. So it's not sure that adding more symmetry uh, goes in the good direction. Maybe not. So some numerics could be interesting in, in that in that mm. question. Oh, okay. And uh, so there's another question uh, from Alain Didier Nuchegeme, who's asking if uh, isocell non-equilateral triangles have two axes of symmetry. So if you isocell but not equilateral. Sorry, uh, you said... So you can, you can have a look in the chat if you want to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> also. Yeah, I have a look at that. No, an isocellous triangle, which is not equilateral, I mean, you have, a, let's say, a vertical axis of symmetry, but that you, then you you don't you have just one axis of symmetry for uh, isosceles, which are not equilateral. Okay, and I guess uh, Michael Levitin's question was answered. I think. Yeah, thanks so, was answered. Okay, great. Uh, oh, so Doran. Uh, yeah, miss, maybe I have a remark <laughs> concerning the theorem two with the width. Yeah, I think that's indeed true in any dimension. Ah. <laughs> and this okay. could be okay. somehow related to the fact that when you look to one dimension problem and you measure the volume of the intersection with hyperplanes, mm -hmm. you in fact solve a one dimensional problem with a density. Okay. And the Sega Weinberger inequality is true in general for densities, not only for domains. And then if you plug in your width, you get, I think, exactly this inequality. Yeah, we, we thought about the extension in 3D, but uh, yeah, it is uh, interesting to have it in any, in any dimension. We have time for more questions, if uh, anyone has any. I mean, there's already been loads. Ah, does one axis of symmetry to axis of symmetry? Ah, no, uh, this is a question. Oh, what's the question on slides? What's the minute? Yeah, this is, uh, this is a question. Uh, I read very rapidly the question, but in the last slide, I've put uh, something which are open questions for me so i don't know if uh, as, if we start from uh, yeah this one axis to axis so if we know that the optimal set as one axis for example is this true that it has two axes i don't know yeah actually i was wondering um, uh, so you put this convexity assumption to avoid the situations you described at the beginning mm -hmm. of something like that but can you also put a constraint which is that there's not that the domain doesn't become too spiky or something like that something weaker than convexity but yeah so it does not oscillate too much or it, it's not does not yeah maybe i don't know how to to describe this uh yeah i guess maybe maybe it's a bit vague. Uh, yeah, this was a pathological example but uh could be interesting to to work in a in a wider class of domains so of course which which prevent this phenomenon to occur in any case, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, thank you very much.